Ah, yes. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to Veterans Minimum. I'm your host, Nick Dayas. At the Lame Shows, where you can find me. At Veterans Minimum is where you can find the show. I'm joined by two very special guests. Some might interpret special in different ways when some takes start coming. But my guy, Tim, an OG, is back. Yay, yay. Glad to be on the show, bro. How you holding up, man? Doing good. You know, not, not leaving my house too much. Just going for like little jogs around the neighborhood. That's basically the extent of it. So uh, I don't hate my wife, which is good news. <laughs> yeah, that, that's definitely, I think, I think the, uh, a positive of the whole coronavirus stuff is uh, you, you really discover how much you love your significant other. It's Facts. Things like that. Facts. <laughs> and uh also joining us you've probably seen some of his stuff on our social media pages with with vm he's been doing some draft stuff whether it's draft tweets or some posts him and alex have combined brains and formed my guy taryn is in the building taryn what's good bro welcome to uh vm officially making your de- debut brother brother yes thank you for having me i'm super excited to be here You've been doing some stuff with PFF, right? Tell, the, tell people that might not know uh, exactly why we have you on, not because you're just a pretty face that we could look at for an hour. <laughs> I thought that was the only reason. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I've been doing some work with PFF this past season. It was my first, uh, first season with them uh, part-time, so I'm not doing anything off-season. But I basically was a data collector for them. I've just been really into football. So before this past season started, um, I went through their application process and, uh, yeah, so now I go through and collect data from different games, college, pro, you know, whatever it is week by week. And that's the stuff that they end up interpreting and coming to grades and things like that. Sounds very, very nerdy, but I love it. It's definitely nerdy, but yeah, that's why I love it too. <laughs> Hey Tim, is it is it uh is it data or data? You know, I don't I don't I don't know. I I say I say data data. I I say both. I don't know. It depends, right? Yo, you yeah. know what? I actually it's it's funny that I have you on today because when uh, when I text you about this, uh, I was like, Yo, is it prospective or perspective? <laughs> That's I'll never be able to figure that one out. You guys know how I am with my English. It's very uh, subjective as to. I don't even know if I use that one correct. You know what I'm saying? Like you get what you get very different sides when it comes to me with the English. So Tim, I, I mean, like I said, so I'm about 75 percent sure it's the PER version. Teaching America's youth, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I can't plus. spell, bro. It's my one weakness. Like I'll I'll tell you where your periods and commas are fucked up, but I can't spell. All right, good. So I don't feel like a complete asshole, just an asshole here. All right. <laughs> if you guys didn't watch the draft yesterday and you're a sports fan, I don't know what to tell you because it was the one thing that has kind of been keeping us afloat from uh, a media perspective, right? Whereas there's nothing else going on. And you got to fall for the trap for rumors more so than you've done any other year because of nothing else going on. And all these pre-draft visits have been uh, canceled and whatnot. So I want to start off with this. I think what we experienced yesterday and what we're going to experience the rest of the weekend, we are recording this Friday morning early on. There's going to be a full breakdown of the first round and then maybe some fun stuff to end the show as far as like what to look out for. But guys, and I'll throw it to you, Tim, after I finish I think this is the most unique draft in NFL history for many reasons. Obviously, the coronavirus stuff goes without saying, right? The, the, the players weren't able to experience that moment of the commissioner calling their name and them coming out, them being in the green room with their families. Also meant that it was a very nicely paced NFL draft. I don't know how you guys – where do you guys fall on that one, Tim? Like – didn't you feel like the draft went by really quickly and I would even say smooth? Yeah, it was super smooth and quick. I mean, there were some times where uh, where Goodell like did some stuff that was just like, huh? What are you What are you doing, man? But uh, Yo, besides he, that, everything was smooth. At, uh, 
as someone that is a uh, pro marijuana usage, <laughs> yo, was he chopped, bro? Because he looks. I mean, there's a new CBA, man. There's a new that CBA. That new CBA bro. hitting <laughs> different. Knows? He's like, yo, everybody doing it. What's up? <laughs> He completely butchered the announcement of Vegas getting the draft in 2022. For those that don't know, he made that announcement. He said, Vegas, we're coming back to you in 2020. It's like, well, you're there now. So next year, the draft is in Cleveland. And then the year after, they're going back to Vegas. And he also, like, there was a a little, like, make-a-wish kid that was doing the, like, one of the picks. I can't remember. And then over him, he's like, yeah, come back to me. Come back to me now. Come back to me. Come back to me. And then (laughs) they came back to him. And he was silent for like six, seven seconds. Yeah. Let the man. kid finish, man. He's a make a wish kid. Oh man, that was uh I, I tried not to laugh at that because of you know it's a make a wish. I'm not not the make a wish kid before I get tweets. Goodell <laughs> just standing there awkwardly. Yo, that has to be the worst being in front of a camera, son, and them cutting to you, and sometimes you don't know exactly what the timing is gonna be. Like they might be like, All right, back to you. Caitlin in the office and then Caitlin's just kind of like on Instagram or some shit or fucking eating her food and they don't know when the cut is coming and it did seem like Goodell was being a little awkward uh, for a lot of a lot of the draft actually do you know what else was awkward and I don't mean to sound like before I get tweets I don't mean to sound like <laughs> insensitive but why these kids have their best moment of their life and like I understand you got to bring it up but the first thing for everything is like this kid's sister died, and this kid's dad died. I noticed and this that kid's too. Dad committed suicide, but it was because of the pills. Like, wh- why? What is the purpose of bringing it up first? Yeah. Before anything else, and yeah. basketball highlights before football highlights. It's like, yo, whoever's putting these highlights together, yo, you need to order it a little better. ESPN. Yo, I was, I was gonna bring that up too when they, when, uh, when Ruggs got drafted by Oakland, the first thing you see is a high school highlight tape of basketball. And I'm like, oh, can we get some slants? Can we Becton get a post two. route? What's up? Becton, too. The first yeah. thing you saw was him dunking on people. Yeah. Yeah. Taryn, how'd you feel about the pace of the draft, man? Because I, I, I do think that it, it got banged out in, like, what, three hours and 15 minutes, I think? Yeah, it was it was pretty quick. It, it felt really smooth. I got to be honest, I wasn't expecting that. You know, it had its hiccups, but for the first time doing it like that, that's got to be expected. Um, but it went like a lot better than I thought. Honestly, another thing that I loved about it was I could just look at the different GMs and coaches' war rooms, so to speak, and compare them all day. That was so funny to me, like comparing Gettleman and his binder and little school laptop to like Belichick and Sean Payton with all their computers and phones and everything. It was hilarious. Yo, what about Kingsbury? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude. His, his career. That guy was recording for Brazzers, if you ask me. So that's the kind of <laughs> setup that that was. That looked like the, if, I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, Californication on Showtime. You guys ever seen that show? I, that, I've it, seen, I've it, seen, it looks yeah. like the house that uh, that Charlie's ex-wife married the new dude with the big with the big dick. Man. Oh, anyway, and <laughs> no, you know no, what? No, no. I, I I know Whoa. what you're talking about. I've seen I've seen I've seen some episodes of that because my mom loves that show. I but, love that show. Great. Yo, show. yeah. That I was like, what the fuck? Where are we? Is this Damble's Arians crib? Like, what the fuck is happening? That ass. <laughs> and you know. seen. And you've seen Dimitrov, he had a fucking blue couch that if he sat in it, that shit would have, like, just eaten him alive. That was the biggest couch <laughs> I've ever seen. It was, like, 10 feet tall. It was. I did, I, Taryn, to add some more to your point, man, I really enjoyed cutting to the war rooms and just the people that they had around them, too. I thought it was really, really, it was, dude, they lived like fantasy football players. When you draft, yeah. when you do online drafts and shit, which if you don't do live drafts, I've been telling Tim for fucking years now. I'm like, yo, you got to do a live draft, bro. It hits Max. different. When you have the I, I've board, done it. I've done it. It's much better. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. We've done, we've done some drafts together in person. But if, for those of you that draft at home on your computers and shit and, like, you're in the comfort of your own home or in your backyard, man, they live the life. For one night of a fantasy football player doing his draft because that's exactly how it's set up you have your binders of notes not binders you might have like 
a, a binder with notes or a notebook. You have your laptop up and running. You're, you're, you're not around people for the most part. You're isolated. Like my guy Gettleman was in the bunker. Just mask on. Yeah, you wearing a mask. <laughs> He's not taking no – he's not playing no games, you know. There's enough heat <laughs> on Gettleman. He's like, I can't have this Rona come and hit me. So on a more serious note, though, I think one thing that you're going to see is – it's going to be a very – you're going to get a lot of value and great players in rounds four, five, six, seven. And I kind of I, – I made this point to Taryn yesterday when I hopped on IG Live. I had my buddy Gordon Hill. He tried out for the then San Diego Chargers, came out of Sacred Hearts University. He was a DB. I didn't know all this stuff. Teams get 30 draft visits. That I knew. But I didn't know – how important those are where he was in San Diego for four or five days with the team being shown the facilities, the coaching staff, the players were coming to visit. And he said how that was very important because he was able to go from a guy from a D2 school undraft, well, D1 AA, they play like Hofstra and Central Michigan and shit. He was able to go from an undrafted free agent caliber player to play himself into the draft. Now he went undrafted, but he popped up on their radar fifth, sixth round, and he was on the phone with these guys because of these pre-draft visits. So what you're going to see is a lot of these rookies, they won't be able to report to teams until training camp because they won't be able to go to mini camp in these off-season workouts right after the draft because teams can't link up. And also those meetings are very important for the kid that's from Sacred Hearts University or from Hofstra where he can go there and he can have an interview with a GM or a coach and put himself over to use the wrestling term and hype himself up and be like, yo, I'm better than these dudes and shit and like answer their questions and test for them. And now they don't have that luxury. So that dude that you might get in the fifth round, who if he had some of these meetings could have been a third round pick, it's going to be a very, very deep draft because I do think that some players didn't get the luxury of being able to put themselves over because of the coronavirus and this outbreak that's going on. Yeah, even the undrafted free agent pool is probably going to be stronger than we've seen in a long time. I think you bring up a great point. Um, it's going to be interesting, too. It's going to be like a, an arms race almost. So who's going to be able to get on these kids' phones first and be able to contact them and and be able to sign them as undrafted free agents and who's going to be able to make that make that connection. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think because of all this, even the first round, this was the chalkiest first round that I've ever seen probably where, you know, a lot of mock drafts kind of hit it nail on the head outside of like, maybe Andrew Thomas wasn't the first tackle off some boards, but there was a tackle in that spot. And and Simmons dropping to eight was something that people were talking about a lot and everything kind of went chalk and there was no real movement in the first 15 or so picks. So, I mean, in, in terms of that, the chalkiness of the first round shows you how like kind of everyone's on the same page and it's a, uh, it's well, everyone except the, you know, the few teams that are like the Falcons that do their own thing. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's going to be interesting to see that those late round guys. And I'm, I'm excited about day three, which I'm never excited about. Yeah, this is very unique. If there's anything to take away from the 2020 draft is unique. We've never seen anything like this. Uh, let's get into it, man. Let's start talking about the draft a little bit. I, I also agree with you, Tim, M my fault. I also agree with you that from a, what a team desperately needs you're right. Andrew Thomas was on the radar for the Giants. They have him as their number one tackle, but all signs pointed to every Giant fan wanted Simmons, like myself. I wanted Simmons, but the smart play was to take a tackle. So it it wasn't a surprise that they took a tackle. Might have been a surprise to that it was Andrew Thomas, but there are a lot of ties, and that's another thing, man. I think I think the affiliation between some of these coaches from college and the pros really showed out in this draft. So let's get right into it. Taryn, 
Number one is Joe Burrow. Are you a Burrow guy from what you saw? I am a Burrow guy. It took me a little bit longer, I think, to hop on that train than kind of the rest of the consensus. But, man, it was like even though it's kind of a one-season wonder, when that one season is arguably the best from a college QB that you ever see, you just it would just be irresponsible to pass up on that, I think. So I, I'm a little hesitant. He's he's good. He's gonna be a, a a franchise guy. I understand that, but to say he was that unanimous, like yo, if Tua was healthy, he's the number one pick. That's just what I thought from when I saw him last year, and even this year. If he didn't get hurt, there was no question marks. He was the number one pick. He's a new breed, new age kind of quarterback in 2020. I talked about it last year with Daniel Jones, how I'm not comparing the two, but the style of play between the two quarterbacks, it's like, yo, the Giants got rid of Eli Manning, who was a, a, a 2006 quarterback, and now you got a 2020 quarterback, a guy that could pick up a third and eight. And they did show Joe Burrow being a little elusive and whatnot, but I just think, Tim, that it does seem a little scratchy how – like head scratching it was how good of a season he had where it came out of nowhere for me the joe burrow comparisons and a shout out to brett coleman who is a guy that i, I love his youtube channel the draft room and I, I i learned a lot from him so a lot of the scouting report like the scouting that i did on joe burrow was also through him so i got my ideas and then i went to see it myself i think like do you remember the old madden days when they had the qb vision yeah right I think that, that Joe Burrow's QB vision is the entire field. And I think that more than physically stepping up, I think that mentally he stepped up to a point last year where he had the best season in college football history because of how he looks at the field. And the way he looks at the field is he, he, he's not ever following a receiver. Like you see a lot of quarterbacks and you're, and you're talking about their heads turning. Like he was so um, advanced mentally that he was like – a great point guard uh, in the NBA and a great point guard in the NBA doesn't watch where players are cutting. He watches the spaces on the field. And I think that's what Joe Burrow does. He watches the spaces on the field. And when you do that, it allows you to have the highest quarterback rating in the NCAA when flushed out of the pocket, right? This is a guy who for some reason has a reputation of a statuesque, a statuesque dude, but he was, when he was on the run, he was almost better than he was in the pocket. And when you're looking at guys like Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson and the new wave of even like Andrew Luck, um, to, to shout out to Nick, his boy. Yeah. Um, but when you look at that, those are guys who see the field so well that when a play breaks down, they have the advantage rather than the defense. And I think that's what Joe Burrow brings. He brings uh, that wrinkle where if a play, play breaks down and – you're a defensive coordinator and you call the exact right play, you're almost in a worse position because Joe Burrow is just mentally uh, to the next level. Unlike Justin Herbert, who physically has a tool, but mentally has a lot of questions, right? For me, I'm ra I'd rather have the cerebral quarterback over the quarterback who checks all the boxes of physical traits because we've seen those guys go come in and flail out in the past. So um, I, I, I'm a Joe Burrow guy. I love Joe Burrow. I think that's the pick. He, he obviously rep in Ohio, like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, gotta love that if you're a Cincinnati Bengals fan. So yeah, I think Joe Burrow is a no brainer here for me. I'm always just a little hesitant when a guy comes out of nowhere the year before no one in their right mind saw this kid play and say first round pick. And I understand the pairing with Joe Brady when he came down there, but dude, they had five first-round picks go in the draft, bro. Like, it's not like he elevated Boston College. He elevated a team that is loaded. And Justin Jefferson went in the first round. The running back went in the first round. They always produced defensive players, and they had guys go in the first round again. The other wide receivers that he had, too, they'll be first-round picks. If, I'm just a little hesitant, man. I'm a little concerned. I think he's going to be fine. But I wouldn't be – I'm going out on a limb and saying that he's not going to be as good as people think. 
Hey, just to play devil's advocate, and we'll talk about it when we get to Tua, but Tua threw to the top two wide receivers in the NFL draft. That's so you can say that about point. Tua, too. That's very fair. Yeah. Yeah, and the knock on Alabama quarterbacks have always been that they never translate because of the talent that they play around. So, yeah, that's a very good point. Chase Young goes number two to the Redskins. Like, just the biggest lock as – Burrow was to go to the Bengals, right? Ron Rivera coming over there. He's known for his defense. He always likes to have that guy that he can anchor his defense. Chase Young goes over there. Many people said best player in the draft. Also that he's better than the Bosa brothers coming over from Ohio State. Also, you're looking at the front four for the Redskins. You're looking at a very similar mold to what the Niners have put together. Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, Montez Sweat, Ryan Kerrigan. Now you throw Chase Young in there, too. You're talking about first-round pick after first-round pick. And also, with all this passing in the NFL, you need to have some depth at the defensive line position in order to rush the passer. So one thing that kept the Jaguars in games the last couple of years is that they had four or five defensive ends, not defensive linemen, defensive ends that they could just rotate. Right, like Yannick is the big get that a lot of people want. I'm I'm dying for the Giants to make a move to get him. But this is a dude who he's never had less than eight sacks in a season. He's never had more than twelve. But the reason why is that he's playing like only fifty percent of the snaps that he can. So when you're looking at Washington, they've really built their team the way the Niners have in the sense of just throw mad first round picks at the front line and then that'll take care of everything else. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's Ron Rivera too. Like, if you're a if you're a Redskins fan and you've been watching this team throw money at free agents and just kind of build teams the wrong way for a long time, the last two drafts you got to consider real home runs for for them because what do you do? Like, whether you like Dwayne Haskins or not, and that's yet to be determined. You get your quarterback, right? Whether you like you said, like yeah, it could be a <laughs> fart, but I mean, it's at least you get your quarterback who you like at the very least. And then you get the guy to rush the quarterback and all of a sudden you're building an identity, right? And, and you're building from the inside out rather than the outside in, which is what they've been doing for so long. They've been making big splashes, um, you know, like Josh Norman, Deshaun Jackson, guys like kind of around the perimeter. And now they're building from the inside out. And Ron Rivera brings that kind of team building mentality over from Carolina where they've had, they had a perennial, per, like the last couple of years don't, I mean, Cam was hurt, but before that, they were perennially in the mix in that division for years and years and years. So that's what the Redskins want to build. And if I'm a Redskins fan, I'm super happy about this pick. And, you know, if he doesn't work out, then you can't really blame them because he is, like, across the board, unanimous, going to be a stud. Aaron, how do you feel about Chase Young? I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty easy when you have a player like that. It's funny that you mentioned the Bosa brothers because my favorite thing about watching Chase Young this year, like getting ready for the draft, was that I remember last year watching Nick Bosa and being like, this is a can't-miss prospect. This is what an elite, an elite edge prospect looks like. I don't even know how it can get better than that. And then you watch Chase Young and you're like, oh, that's how it can get better than that. It's, it's He's truly special. Like, and... It started like the the hype started dying down a little bit. I saw towards like the end of the season because like oh he didn't get any sacks like his last two games or whatever. And it's so funny when you watch and he's trying to rush the passer and there's literally three O linemen just yeah. trying to block him. And yeah, I mean it's it's it was a good pick. It's really a can't miss prospect as much as you know that's possible. So. Before we move on, I want to mention that Dwayne Haskins was also a one year starter. Through like fifty touchdowns, just say just just a little concerning. Just, uh, okay, I like I like sample size. Bill Parcells, I read his book, and he mentioned how the number is thirty. Thirty starts for a kid coming into the NFL is what you ideally want. Because after thirty starts, bro, like, dude, how many times have you seen guys like Tim Tebow was a thing for like seven games? You know, like guys come in and even yo. I know, Tim, you feel different about this, but, like, Cap also, Kaepernick, they stripped him of his weapons. I understand that. And they did. But, like, you know, those first 20 games, Tim was like, yo, greatest quarterback i ever seen. What did you take of, like, number one overall in your fantasy league that year? I took him in the second round, yeah. S- second round, yeah. So, Dude, I, well, I, t- <laughs> I took him in, like, the third round, too. I think he was the first quarterback taken off the board in the year that I did that. So, 
just saying that you need you need a you need a sample size when you're talking about quarterbacks. There's a lot a lot can happen. Uh, all right, this was another layup for me too. When no trade happened and Detroit was on the clock, they lose Darius Slay, Okuda, three straight Ohio State players. Well, affiliates Joe Burrow. He was there and then he transferred. Um, probably the most. He's my favorite corner in the draft because of his attitude. That video that went viral of him when that reporter asked him at the combine about how, you know, you gotta you gotta clean up some things in your game with the penalties and when I was like, yo, I didn't get flagged one time for defensive holding. He's like, go check the tape. I was like, oh, I like this kid. Dude, can I just that guy quit journalism yeah. <laughs> because of the hate he was getting on Twitter for that question. Well, you can't talk out your ass, bro. Uh, yo, take it, son. I've said, no, t- I still true. get shit about Mitch Trubisky still Which, to this y- day. Yeah. I mean, make so. it. you should, you should, <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I, you're right, dude. If you can't, if you can't take the criticism, then it's, it's the wrong, it's the wrong field for you to be in Facts. It's the wrong business for you to be in. Because I say this all the time and I say it when I give out picks, when I give out plays and DFS takes, no matter what it is, they all tie in together. You're trying to be perfect in an imperfect world. 55% on picking spreads, you can become a professional better. 55%. Dude, if you get a 55 on a test, Tim, you give a 55 to a kid in class. Fail. Fail. You're failure. <laughs> in sports betting, you can pass. 60, you get a, you give someone 60, you're still kind of failing, right? That's still failing? A 65 is passing these days. Yeah. All right, all right. So you go, you get a 60. Dude, if I knew... I, if I could guarantee myself I'd pick 60% against the spread every single year for the rest of my life, I'd probably quit working. For real, I'm not kidding. Oh, yeah. Like 60%. Nick There's ways that you can make right now. hundreds of thousands of dollars. No one's in Vegas right now. What about that shot? See that shot when they showed Vegas? You guys never been to Vegas, right? Dead zone. Never. No, I've never been there. Oh, first of all, you guys need to fix that whenever all this stuff changes. I've been telling Tim for years. Second of all, that was a crazy visual, man. And Tim, I could relate it to something that hits home for you that look like you ever see Times Square like that, bro? Like Times Square is always lit no matter what. And to see that shit ghost town for me, when I saw that, it's how you know, I have issues. I saw that. And I was like, yo, that visual, like meant a lot to me. Not seeing people on the streets <laughs> of Vegas, bro. It was crazy. It was crazy to see. It was, it was, it was definitely really crazy wild. to see. It's, it's, it's kind of like not seeing people in, in Times Square, you're right. It's fucking – this whole thing is so nuts, man. So, going back to the lines, they take Okuda, Jeff Okuda, the corner. Um, w- w- obvious, no? Taryn, wasn't it obvious, especially when they got rid of Slay? And, like, no, the only thing I was waiting for, because I was streaming when this happened and Taryn was in the chat, and you're like, all right, this is where the draft starts. Yeah, I mean, for me, I said it was where the draft starts because I was thinking if someone's going to trade up for like a Tua, say, this was where that was like a possibility. But yeah, like you said, once the pick was in, I mean, it, it, it was chalk, just like the first two. Smart pick. I love it. You know, Akuda's awesome. He was one of my favorite watches throughout this whole process. But yeah, it, no surprise. This is going to be high praise for me, but watching Jeff Okuda play in college reminds me of shades of Darrell Rivas. Uh, The reason why is because of the physicality. I think one of the the, the things that you look for in a cornerback is are they willing to get dirty and make the tackles? Are they willing to slam bigger dudes on the line? And then do they have the speed to recover if they get beat off the line? And I think that's what Darrell Rivas had in spades. He was never the fastest guy, but he had great recovery speed. And I think Jeff Okuda as well, not the fastest dude, but definitely great recovery speed, ran a 4.8 at the combine, I believe. And then he he is not afraid to get nasty and dirty and make the tackles on the running backs and and slam people on the line. And that's what it's going to be in the NFL. Like, if, if, you're, if you're not ready for the heat, stay out the kitchen. I think Jeff Okuda is, is built for the heat. And so I, I love this pick for the Lions. And somewhere where we've talked about – we talked about this a lot in our in the past VM days, Nick, where – Bill Belichick has that scheme where he puts the number one cornerback on an island against the number two receiver, and then they double the the um, 
the the number one. And I think with Trufant and Okuda now, that mm. gives that gives uh, Patricia, a Belichick right. disciple, that kind of ability to do that and make that happen. And now they, you know, they they improved that defensive line. It was really the 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 fall of Snacks Harrison last year was disappointing to see, but um, the offensive line has some weapons and. I think I mean the defensive line has some weapons, and I think the Lions really improved their defense uh, with this one for sure, hundred percent. Yeah, good call on them. They've been copying the mold that worked for them in New England, so that's something that they're bringing over. Fun fact: um, um, there's more former New England Patriots on the Detroit Lions right now than there were Detroit Lions when Matt Patricia took over. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm sure you could probably say the same thing about the Titans too. Haven't the Titans brought in a bunch of I don't know if that's the same case, but I'm just saying that they have a lot of former Patriots as well. Um, all right, for the number four pick. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> got to bring out all the stops for those of you watching the clip. You know, I don't like the guy, but I got to show love and a little role play for this one, you know, a little cosplay. My glasses are fogging up because of the mask, so that's not going to be able to work. But <laughs> I put on a mask because Dave Gettleman was in isolation by himself. No one seen, no one seen in the room with him. But he had a mask on because my GM is not trying to take any risks, Tim. You know what I'm saying? He's a man of the people. So, well, you could tell. I don't know about no risks after that draft pick, but you know we could talk about that too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, tell me what was what was so risky about it because. Per the Giants, they had him as their number one tackle on the board. Also, I mentioned in the beginning of the show how one common theme, and obviously I was talking about my team, coaches listen to each other. And Kirby Smart is the head coach of Georgia. He had Andrew Thomas. Kirby Smart was also with Alabama when Joe Judge was there. Also the running back coach for Alabama, Burns is now the running back coach for the New York Giants. So this is a lot of tight knit clicks between the two. You always heard about Nick Saban and Belichick and all the disciples being able to say, yo, you should talk to one another. If Nick Saban has a guy or if he, there's a player in the SEC that Belichick likes, he goes to Nick Saban because he's scouting for him. He's probably recruiting him. He knows of him. So that's what you saw here. And a lot of momentum was – coming in on the Giants towards the tail end. And I got some sources, too, that I've developed over the last couple of years. And they were telling me, like, yo, stop this pipe dream of Simmons. They're taking a tackle. And it was between the three. It was between Thomas, Wirfs, and Wills Jr. from Alabama. I kind of honed in on Wills Jr. because Joe Judge was there. He saw him for the last couple of years, also with the running back. But they go with Thomas. The one thing about Thomas is – it's very important for the Giants to fix the offensive line, as it is for many teams. But when you look at what the Giants have, they have an elite running back, and they have a quarterback that they believe in. And the quarterback needs to not turn the ball over 17 times a game. One way to do that is to make sure that he's upright, and they did that with addressing it with an offensive tackle and Andrew Thomas. He was one of the consensus top three offensive linemen. In the draft, everyone has different evaluations of how they have rankings. But he's a guy who I think is going to be a day one starter right away for the Giants. And that's exactly what the Giants leave this draft with. Um, I mean, for me, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm, I'm some kind of offensive line talent evaluator. So take what I say with a grain of salt here. Um but when you're looking at the four offensive linemen that were on the top, and uh, for me, the, what I was reading, Andrew Thomas could seem to be the consensus number four tackle on the, on the board. Um, and when you look at what makes these guys stand out, right, you see the athletic ability of Tristan Wirfs. You see that Makai Becton is a complete animal human being of a man. And then you've got Wills, who looks like the complete package, right? He was protecting – uh, the blind side for Tua on the right side, but people can definitely say that he can go over to the left side with no problem, right? With Andrew Thomas, it was kind of like he did a lot of things. He did everything well, but nothing really stood out. So, um, like, even – I know I don't want to put too much 
Um, I don't want to put too much into this, but 21 bench press reps at the combine. Eh, not really great. Um, one, one offensive line coach said he's not an ass kicker. And I think when you're looking for someone there, you want an ass kicker. And um, I mean, this could work out again. I'm not an offensive line scout. I just, it, it just, it makes me wonder um, what the giants saw in this guy and what you say, the connections with coaches could be the case, what he, what they saw amongst the other guys, because the other three guys seem to have really standout traits that made them stand out above the rest um, in terms of evaluation. So again, not an all-on evaluator. This could be a great pick for the Giants. I do like the position pick um, for the Giants. I think they need a tackle. Um, Nate Solder uh, hasn't been the guy that they paid for to be, so um, maybe moving him over to the right side and seeing what Andrew Thomas can do on the left side is a, is a good move for the Giants. Aaron, thoughts? Um, I, I, like I told you yesterday, I was a big fan of that. Andrew Thomas was my uh number one offensive tackle on my board um and I actually don't disagree with Tim's overall evaluation of it like how a lot of the when you look at the top four or five guys have like those standout traits um which they do but that's kind of the reason that ultimately I put Andrew Thomas for my number one because although he doesn't like really stand out like he he's not a road grader he's not gonna run everyone over he doesn't have the agility like Jedrick Wills Jr. he's good at everything he's pretty well-rounded and not a lot of negatives there so you can there's not really a like a scheme or a style that doesn't fit and there's not a matchup that's going to really hurt you know he, all around he's just going to be able to help the offensive line do whatever the Giants are trying to do so I was fan of the pick so it's funny that you mentioned that because I actually have a video coming out later on the YouTube channel. It's called draft cliches. And uh, one of them that I had was Swiss army knife. And the thing that I put for Swiss army knife was B minus everywhere. It doesn't do anything great, but it's just solid. So you throw <laughs> them out there. So I guess that's what Andrew Thomas falls under. I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> As long as he's protecting Daniel Jones, I think that's the thing that you need. Opening up holes for Saquon. Yeah, yeah, you do. Because, man, I, I, I like to think that I'm a very uh, honest fan of the New York Giants. They're not going to make the playoffs. They're not going to win the Super Bowl. But I do think they could be a team that could be – they're one of my top three candidates to be a team to make a run – there's always a team in the NFL that goes from worst to first, right? Or a team that goes from, you know, five wins to 10. They double their wins. I think the Giants might be in play for that this year. If Daniel Jones doesn't turn the ball over as much, if some of these guys that they brought in defensively could work out like they did in 2016, it could be something. And I think Andrew Thomas, too, man, you throw him in and he could be a day one starter for you, which he should be if he's going in the top 10, top five. Uh, I like it. I like it from the sense that they needed a tackle. Every Giants fan that I spoke to wanted a tackle, and they were telling me, yo, it's going to be a tackle. And it ends up being a tackle. So it wasn't like they drafted a cornerback. They drafted something that they really, really need. And then we just got to wait and see. Yeah, they didn't pull the Falcons. Shout out to Allen. <laughs> Shout out to Allen. Uh, Dolphins, Tua. Tua gets picked. What about a little bit of rev I got to take the mask off, man. It's hot. It's hot. <laughs> Yo, what about a little revisionist history? If you remember, Miami was the team that passed up on Drew Brees because of shoulder issues and injuries. And they end up going with Dante Culpepper. And that alters not just their history, not just the wow. Saints history, but football history. Because think about it. What if Brees goes to Miami when he was supposed to, when he was a free agent? And then Saban is still there. Saban probably stays, right? Because you got to figure you're going to be winning with, with Breeze. And I understand Peyton has been a big part of Drew Breeze's success and in playing indoors and playing in the Superdome. But does Saban go back to Alabama? Does Alabama become into this juggernaut? Do we see Julio Jones? Do we see Amari Cooper? Do we see Judy? Do we see all these C.J. Moseys and defensive players? Does Brady go on to be as great as he was in Belichick? Because now they got to play Drew Breeze twice a year. And 
Tim, as someone that roots for a team in the AFC East, how much of a cakewalk has that been for the Patriots the last 20 years? A big part of your success is the division that you play in, right? Like, dude, the Chargers. Yo, girl, if you're a kid that can understand football and you're within, you know, 18 to 30 and you're a Chargers fan, yo, you went 12 and four two years ago, bro. And you were, a, you were the five seed because you had, you had the Chiefs in your division. So it's like, yo, so much of your success is dictated on whether or not your division is good. And now, full circle, this really was like, we're giving you another chance, Miami. This is a prospect that was probably going to go one. They had all the tank for two assigns in, uh, I think it's Sun Life Stadium in Miami. And then don't fuck this up again. Take the risk, yo, because the upside – Yo, people whiff on first-round picks year in, year out. I, I talk about this all the time. A third of them are out the league, a third of them are traded, and then a third of them become all pros. That's just how it is, right? Yo, take the risk. The upside is way more precious than anything else. So that's how I feel about Miami taking Tua. Tim? I think uh... – yeah, I think this is a no-brainer for Miami. The tank actually worked. You know, this, this Tua injury actually ended up being a blessing for them. I think really the question is, can he stay healthy, right? Because you have an offensive line that's one of the worst offensive lines still in football. So you, you'd imagine that he's not going to start the year uh, as a quarterback. Is Probably he'll, he'll be behind Ryan Fitzpatrick for a little while. And if he gets hit, can he take it? Because, you know, a lot of, a lot of, not a lot, a lot is being made of the fact that he's kind of a small guy. Uh, six foot on a good day, 5'11", um, by some measurements. So can he take the punishment of an NFL season? I think that's the question that's going to be uh, had because when you're talking about Drew Brees, Drew Brees also had a, an injury um, that made him drop into the second round. That worked out. Um, but when you're talking about other littler guys like um, Russell Wilson, like he was healthy his whole time when he was a college quarterback. So, I mean – you have to, like, I think, like you said, Nick, you have to take the chance. I think for the first time in 20 years, it's, it's reasonable to say that the Patriots have the worst quarterback in the AFC East. And I think, like you said, with, with um, divisions, I mean, what you're going to see later on with the Las Vegas Raiders and with a couple of other teams, divisions really led the way on how some of these, thing, how some of these th teams thought uh, when making these draft picks. So mm -hmm. I think that with my, with the dolphins, you got to take Tua here. I think that, you know, shout out to the, to the department of Bill Belichick coming over with, uh, Brian Flores and spreading misinformation like fucking crazy. Uh, the week leading up to this draft, making people think the Miami Dolphins were not going to take Tua and they were going to take Justin Herbert trying to keep, probably trying to keep, people away from trading up into spots to take two in front of them. Um, and it worked. The misinformation campaign worked. So kudos to them. Um, so, yeah, I think, like you said, that's upside is just too great. If it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. You have to shoot your shot on a guy like Tua who had the most efficient college career ever. Now, like I said before, he was throwing to the top two wide receivers in the NFL draft this year. But you can't fault the guy for playing with the players that he played with. Um, he also played against the top competition in college. So um, I, I would say that evens out. I'm a fan of Tua's attitude, Tua's whole vibe. Um, I'm hoping that he doesn't have that much success because I'm a Jet fan. And, you know, that's the last thing I need, the, the Tom Brady train to be derailed by the Tua train. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think this is a great pick for the Dolphins. No brainer. Taryn, what are your thoughts on Tua? I'm with you 100%. Pretty much everything you guys just said. Um, if it wasn't for the injury, he might be my QB1 as well. It's like he was overshadowed a lot by Joe Burrow this year, even when he was healthy, because I think Joe Burrow was a little uh, like flashier of a play style, and that LSU team was just so much fun to watch, and it wasn't Bama. But um, he did did it this year too and but the difference is he did it last year as well I mean people I don't, forget how good Tua was last year too probably because you know they're not scouting him as in depth because he's not 
actually eligible for the draft. But even last year, that kid was slinging it. And, yeah, I'm a big fan. I agree with Tim. I bought into the smoke screen. I was like, it's going to be so Dolphins. They're just going to – two is going to fall into their lap and they're going to take Herbert anyway. Because uh, you just kept hearing that the last few days. But, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad they ended up with him. I'm a big, big fan. People tend to forget, Taryn, what happened the year before. And especially when something new comes over, something shiny. Right, Joe Burrow out of nowhere and LSU. Mm-hmm. Like, LSU is – Look, they're not fucking UConn when it comes to football. Like, they're a team that's in national spotlight, but it's not like Alabama. There's, uh, I do believe that people get tired of dynasties eventually. Like, they're good and bad. And Alabama's been running rough shop through everyone in college football. And then you get this new thing like, oh, yeah, what's happening over there in Baton Rouge? Oh, oh, look at him go. And then Tua gets hurt, too. Same shit that happened with Pat Mahomes this year, man. Same shit happened. Pat yeah. Mahomes got hurt. Chiefs went like two and three or some shit, whatever it was. And everyone's like, oh, my God, Lamar Jackson, Lamar Jackson. They're fucking yeah. blowing their lows to Lamar Jackson. And look, Lamar Jackson had a great season. The Ravens had a great season. It's like, yo, hold on, man. Like, Mahomes came back. He was a little rusty because he didn't play for six weeks. And then I, I remember saying, I'm like, yo, look, they're 12 to one before they play the Pats. They beat the Pats, and then the rest is history. People just forget. So that's what I think happened with Tua. And I just – I agree with you. I did feel like they were going to take Herbert, which leads into this next pick. Justin Herbert goes to the Chargers. I think it would have been cooler if Tua went to the Chargers because I think Tua has the makeup of being like a, a – he, he seems like he has more juice and charisma than Herbert. And Herbert – Man, I was the biggest Marcus Mariota fan, I think, out there. Uh, and there has to be – something needs to be said about these quarterbacks coming from Oregon. When that first read isn't there, Tim, they seem to get deer in the headlights. And if I could defend Mariota for just one second, he had like five offensive coordinators in six years. And they always say how having a new offensive coordinator is like reading a, uh, learning a new language. And I think with Justin Herbert, the one thing you got to be concerned with with the Chargers is that going to translate over to the next level again with the Oregon quarterback. Tim, technical difficulties? Yeah, I'm having a little technical difficulties over here. My bad. Did Um, you hear what I said, though? I did. I I got it broken up a little bit. Um, Are you watching porn? Is that what it is? (laughs) (laughs) That's what the Um, iPad is for, brother. (laughs) <laughs> uh yeah i mean herbert has all the physical tools um like you were saying i know that you were saying about oregon quarterbacks and uh not trusting oregon quarterbacks i kind of feel like i kind of feel the same way about herbert um you know if you look two years ago a 59 percent completion percentage which you know he got it up to 67 percent this year but um not ideal i know that you've been scouting herbert for the longest time nick because uh suck for the duck was the, the model before daniel jones uh took over but um in terms of the chargers i think you have to add a quarterback mm-hmm. i think that you have to add something that's going to bring excitement to a new stadium and uh you know a, a fan base where you actually where you're really you're really competing for fans out there and it hasn't looked good for them the past two years. So they have to bring in something new, something fresh. This guy checks all the boxes in terms of physical tools. He's got the arm. He's got the look, he's got the brains. He, he scored the highest, uh, the highest on the Wonderlick test, which if you look at the Wonderlick test and I actually took the Wonderlick test the other day, it's first of all, it's not hard. Uh, Tua, I don't, I don't know what you're doing there. <laughs> Second of all, I don't know what the fuck it has to do with quarterbacking at all whatsoever. Like, really, it's just your ability to think on your toes and critically think, which, you know, is fine. Um, I, think, I, think that, I think that's it right there, what you just said. Uh, so much of a – dude, a quarterback a quarterback got 30 seconds, and, and that might even be a stretch, to step up to the line of scrimmage, make sure all his fucking idiot teammates are set up. I don't know why I, that, that seemed mad harsh. Like, I have, like, an, a vendetta against, like, teammates. <laughs> but – and then you have to – all right, yo, we're going up the A gap on the left side, right? But they're blitzing from here. So then 
in, in 30 seconds, you got to make sure everyone's aligned. You got to know what the play is going to be. You got to read the defense. And then when the snap happens, you have to be able to quickly make your read there too. So I think the wonder lick is exactly what you said. You kind of answered your own question where you don't understand what it has to do with quarterback. I think it has a lot to do with quarterback with the critical thinking, the quick hitting stuff and not improv because you have the answers there, but being able to think on your toes really quick. I think that's a lot to do with quarterbacking. I hear that. I hear that. And I, de- I definitely hear that. But one thing I like to say to my students is um, if an elephant was judged by his ability to climb trees and he would live his whole life thinking he was stupid. Um, I don't know if that necessarily translates, although like what else are you going to do? I guess either way had a high one to league score. So that's good for him. Um, I, he's going to have a lot of weapons. He's going to be able to throw to Keenan Allen. He's going to be able to throw to Mike Williams. Um, He's going to be able to play behind an offensive line who got better this year. Um, So, I mean, tight uh, Hunter Henry, how could I forget? So, I mean, he'll have every, every opportunity to succeed and we'll see how it goes. But I think if you're the chargers, this is also a no brainer pick. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but you've got to take the shot on Herbert who has all the tools to be, the type of superstar quarterback that you're hoping for. And uh, hopefully he can progress and make those reads. And, and, you know, you have to, you have to take a quarterback here for the Chargers. I also think that, uh, Taryn, I just want to add one more thing to what Tim said is he didn't really have a lot of weapons at Oregon, man. And that was one thing that I was watching when I was making my pro Herbert case the year before. Now you're talking about, from an offensive weapon perspective, is there a better situation to walk into? Like, how many are better? Mike Williams, Hunter Henry, Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen. Like, you have your vertical jump ball guy. You have your tight end, all reliable. You have a running back out the backfield. You have an improved offensive line. And you got Keenan Allen, who's, in my opinion, the best route runner in football. It's like him and Diggs. And he lives in the slot, one of the best wide receivers out the slot. So, if you're Herbert, I feel like you you could be the only one to fuck this one up. Yeah, I uh, this is the first pick where I, I was struggling to kind of decide where I fall because I am not a Herbert guy. Uh, to me, it's like I said it in in, in your chat yesterday. I was said it's Josh Allen two point oh, but the thing that I didn't mention is that he doesn't have the athleticism. And when there's a quarterback that struggles, like, with accuracy, even if they got the cannon arm, you know, but they struggle with some of those other important things, they can hide it a little bit with their running ability. It's like Mitch Trubisky, why he is so much worse when they're not using him how he should be used. Josh Allen, the same thing. I think without that athleticism, you see a drop in tier of of quarterback play. So that's kind of what he reminded me of. You know, when we were talking about my PFF stuff, you uh, mentioned the nerdiness, so it's about to come out. But, like, for the weapon point, this past year, the percentage of uncatchably off-target throws, which means they're not just inaccurate, like you're missing them by multiple yards. When there's a receiver that's open, so they have over a yard of separation, 5 to 18 yards downfield, Herbert – of all the first round quarterbacks was by far the worst. Uh, 18.1% of those throws were uncatchably off target. Wow. For comparison. That's, that's high. Yeah. Yeah. For comparison Tua at 4.3 Burrow at five uh, Hertz, who's not incredibly accurate either at five. So, you know, I think it's a big risk, but in incremental, improvement at quarterback is so valuable even more than going from trash to all pro at any other position so it's tough hopefully it works out for them you know you you never know they can improve of course Lamar did it he improved a little bit so we'll see that's that's a very telling number there too I also think that the quarterback man it's so weird such an important position, but it seems like there's no patience. And sometimes, like, a guy's – like, yo, Josh Allen uh, – Josh Rosen is shot now. Like, we want to talk about damaged goods. Who knows where the <laughs> fuck his head's at, right? Like, <laughs> you're the 10th pick in the draft. The next year, a team takes a guy number one. They trade you to Miami, who's basically a carbon copy of the team in the AFC 
of the team that you were on in the NFC. And then the year after that, they take a quarterback in the first round. So a lot of it has to do with just your situation, man, so much so. All right, I want to speed up the rest of the top 10 and then kind of just touch on the rest of the draft. And Tim, I'll let, we'll definitely spend some time on on the uh, the JETE. Um, Carolina Panthers take Derek Brown out of Auburn, defensive tackle. I thought that this was a layup to be Simmons, especially Max. when you remember that Luke Keekley retired. I just thought that you don't really – who's the best player on the Panthers right now? Like, I can't even tell you. They lost Bradbury in free agency too. So, they take a defensive tackle in Auburn. He definitely stood out on film because he wore the single digit and you were just saying to yourself, like, who the fuck is that guy, right? (laughs) But I think that it was – this just seemed like a shoe-in for Isaiah Simmons for me, Tim. Yeah, I agree with you. And if you're and if you're the Panthers, like, and you're looking at divisions, right? And you're looking at, all right, so you gotta go with the Saints, the Falcons, and now the Buccaneers with Tom Brady. Like, which one of those teams has an interior rushing offense that you need to stop runs in between the tackles? Um, not many, right? So, I mean, you could say this is a long sighted pick. I just, you know, the Twins, who I do Brodo with. They are completely flabbergasted every anytime someone takes a defensive tackle uh, this early in the draft, and it's kind of they liken it to kind of like taking a center in the NBA in the first round now, and it's just like a, a position that doesn't need to be. For me, I think that running is more important than they think, but at the same time, you're getting a run, a, an up the middle run stopper uh, in a division with you know a, like that plays in the on the perimeter, so. I don't know. It doesn't make much sense to me here. I would much rather go with the Swiss Army knife of Isaiah Simmons, which I think the Cardinals got an absolute steal. And the Cardinals know all about guys who can play multiple positions. They had Honey Badger for a long time, and they got them a lot of, a lot of success. So I think that the Cardinals got a steal, and the the Panthers a little bit of a head scratcher here. Also, they've they've always been doing this, right? Like uh, Jefferson, when they drafted him, he was a dude that they lined up at. Linebacker, slot corner, safety. So they've been doing the on troll roll. They drafted him as a corner. They moved him to safety. Like they've been doing this for years. They just take the like, yo, can you play defense? Yeah, all right, we'll make it work. And yeah, the Cardinals, they got like Patrick Peterson is still a very, very good corner. Chandler Jones, like, never gets respect for being the best pass rusher in fo- football. And I think Isaiah Simmons just makes up so much ground for your team. They kept showing the graphic, and Taryn, I know you saw it with the PFF stuff you were doing. So you played, like, five different positions, yeah. over 100 snaps at those positions. Like, what? Dude, I started right. quoting him in the videos I do for chat sports as a DW, defensive weapon. Like, he has no you, – you don't you don't try to get cute. Like, yo, Steelers used to do this with Palomalo. They would give him the green light. Go off your instinct. Play where you want. Line up where we tell you. But then from there, you decide. And that's what I think you do with Isaiah Simmons. He was he was probably the funnest dude that I watched this year. Like, I really enjoyed him. And he's he's someone that's just – he's just a baller, man. There's just no way – like, the only thing that could prevent him from being an all-pro is if he gets hurt, God forbid, and I'm knocking on wood. But I just think that he was – that's why I was so in love with the idea of the Giants getting him. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with Tim and and the twins on the whole Derek Brown thing. First of all, the value is just not there for me. Like he can end up being an All Pro year one, but you still use the top ten pick on a run stuffing tackle, defensive tackle. If you're gonna take a defensive tackle, you gotta. I think in today's NFL, you have to at least have some pass rushing prowess. Um, but and and then it's just compounded by passing on a guy like Simmons. See, th- th- he's a freak, like you said. You know, so many reps at every single position. It's not like some guys that they're like, oh well, I'm a middle linebacker, but you know, I also line up as safety for 12 snaps. He's like triple digits everywhere: pass rusher, middle linebacker, safety, slot S- corner, S- outside S- corner. Like, it's you. You just I don't know. I don't remember ever seeing anything like that it can plug multiple needs on your defense from play to play, which is just incredibly valuable. So 
Yeah, uh, I'm I'm with you. A bit of a head scratcher from the the Panthers there. And the other thing, it like ran through my head when Tim was talking about kind of drafting based on your division. And you think about like the Cardinals. Okay, Isaiah Simmons today, spy Russell Wilson. Tomorrow, you got 49ers, you know, watch all their behind the line of scrimmage stuff. You're following Debo Samuel, going sideline to sideline. It's just, it, that was a great pick. So, yeah, a little bit of a fall. I was expecting a top five for Isaiah Simmons, but I think it's cool that he's going to be on the Cardinals there. They've improved a lot over the last month, in, yeah. uh, I think. Yeah, you, that's going to be a team that I'm going to be looking at their odds very, very heavily for like a long shot. I always like to punt on a long shot team to win their division, Tim. I did it last year. One of the one of the bets I made was the Niners to win the West. They were plus 700 at FanDuel. I threw a nice $25 spot on them. Nice. Nothing too crazy. But uh, nice there's, just, there's just always a team. There's always a team, man, that goes from worst to first. And I wouldn't be surprised with Arizona if Kyler Murray ends up being the truth. And now you got D-Hop too. Like, what? Christian Kirk, my boy. You guys know I'm the president of that fan club for years now. <laughs> uh, all right. C.J. Henderson goes to Jacksonville. Another one of those picks where Jaguars' top need was probably a corner, especially when they lose both of their corners. They lose Ramsey in the trade, and then they lose Bouye to uh a trade also so it was it was a no-brainer for me um any corner at this point was fine cj henderson staying home not that far i think it was like 50 miles is where he'll be moving to so it's like in-house for him um do you guys have anything to say about cj henderson tim yeah just a couple things number one don't like to pick at all Um, okay you know, the Jaguars, this one stands out as possible. I mean, and again, this could work out. But for me, this stands out as a possible bust. The Jaguars love to draft in state as if they're like a college team. And this is one of the things that they did. And look, this is a need. But when you like, I think, you know, going through the, the history of the draft, when you draft for need and you're not drafting best player, that's not what going to do it for you. And like I said about. Uh, Okuda, I love the fact that he's willing to get nasty and dirty and 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 hit people on the line. That just doesn't come out for C.J. Henderson. The C.J. Henderson couldn't tackle college guys. So, I mean, I it's going to be different with the with the physicality of the NFL. So that's why I'm not sure that I love this pick. And um, yeah, it just this one screams bust to me. Possible possible bust to me. Interesting. What are your uh, thoughts, Taryn? Yeah. A lot of NFL teams were really high on him, I, I think. And, I mean, it's not like I wasn't, like, a number three corner for me. Uh, you know, everyone's valuations are different, so you don't have to go into that much. But I, I'm i never really going to fault a team for drafting a corner, you know, unless it's, like, a big reach. And there might be a team on here where we'll talk about that. But it's uh, – I don't think any team has enough corners as it is. And when you are in desperate need of one, I think that's something, it's a position you just got to throw resources at and take shots at. So I'm not going to fault them for it. All right. Last one in the top 10 I want to get to, and then we're kind of just going to breeze through the rest of the draft, just give uh, thoughts and takeaways and maybe uh, reaches like Taryn just alluded to. Uh, Jedrick Wills Jr., um goes to the Cleveland Browns and this not that I disagree with it I like Wills Jr I really honed in on him with the Giants uh Taryn you brought up a good point and then after that it kind of like resonated with me and it was about how versatile Wills Jr is and how the scheme fits more so the scheme and how he's very agile for his size And also you look at a guy like Baker Mayfield, who's a guy who likes to leave the pocket earlier. And they do like to do some of those zone run, zone passing kind of setups over there in Cleveland. And again, if you think Baker is your guy and you're Cleveland, you go out, you get um, Conklin in free agency. And now you spend another top pick on 
offensive linemen. And, yo, you look at their weapons, dude. Like, say what you want about Odell. Like, dude's a baller. Jarvis, they, they signed the tight end, too, in free agency. I forgot which one it was. Oh, it was um, Austin Hooper. Hooper. Right? Yeah. Hooper. And you got Najoku there. You got Nick Chubb. So, you're talking about an offense that's – if you could just buy some time for Baker, man, they can make noise. So, I don't disagree with offensive line here for the Cleveland Browns at all. Home run pick yeah. here. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. It, was, it, it made me really happy. We talked about it yesterday. I am a big fan of Baker and OBJ, so I do like the Browns. So I was really happy about this pick. Not just that I think he's a really good player and it plugged a need, but it was exactly what you said. It was like It's like football art for me, how perfect he is as, an, as a tackle for the Browns. He works with the scheme and his agility, aside from just, you know, better protection. Uh, Baker, someone last year who struggled with happy feet and scrambling out of the pocket. This is a, this is a tackle that can keep up and, and can actually move, you know, horizontally, vertically, whatever you need. So, uh, yeah, I was a huge fan. All right. Let's take a break real quick. I got to do an ad read. I'll do it live right here because I don't want to have to edit it in. So if you guys could just shut up for about 30 seconds, it'd be nice. With currently no NBA, NHL, or MLB, you might think there's nothing to bet on. Well, you'd be wrong. Our exclusive partner, Bet Online, still has hundreds of events, games, and props to wager on. From the online casino to poker and blackjack, they're bringing Vegas to you. If you're missing the NFL, no problem. Bet Online has live daily NFL Madden. 20 simulations you could bet on you can still bet on survivor big brother american idol stock prices and even the nathan's hot dog eating contest and tim your favorite politics as well all open 24 hours a day and online use promo code blue wire to join and receive your new welcome bonus bet online your online wagering experts yes i know what you guys are thinking wow lamb that was one take no edit yes i'm becoming sort of a professional <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could really bet on stocks, which are bets in themselves. What a world we live in. What a world. Dude, right? You could also bet on the World Series of Poker, which you're betting on betting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's fantastic. It's wow. absolutely fantastic. That's the ultimate right. degenning right there. That is, yeah. yeah. When you bet on someone else that's <laughs> betting, that's like, that's a different level. Between that and like when you bet on a horse, I think horse degenning is... Like, dude, I can't, I can't bet on humans. You want me to take trust in an animal? I can't do it. <laughs> dude, that's the it. way that, that old Greeks around the world have lost fortunes because houses, of horses, bro. bro. Houses. They've <laughs> lost houses. It's crazy. Okay, so I want to breeze through the rest of the first round, just kind of give thoughts. And, like, if you guys want to jump around, I'm cool with that, too. We all have the draft stuff in front of us. But let's just start off with, Makai Becton, offensive tackle from Louisville. Tim, did you want offensive line or did you want wide receiver, which were are the two glaring needs for the New York Jets? And this was a draft that has a lot of them. I thought coming in, it was a very deep wide receiver and offensive tackle class. But before you tell me your thoughts on Becton, what did you really want prior to this pick? I was all about Jerry Judy. Um, maybe C.D. Lamb. I definitely wanted someone to pair with Sam Darnold. Um, with that being said, I like to pick. Um, I think that, you know, I didn't see, I didn't foresee Becton falling here. I really thought Becton was going to go earlier. So I'm, I'm happy that we got Becton for me. Um, when I was looking at tackles, Beck, besides Wills, Becton was the guy who stood out the most. So I'm, I'm happy that we have him here. And I just saw a tweet today that his principal said that he never got in trouble, even though he, he would come in and hug her every day and, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm down with the character of it. And, you know, it's, it's, Joe D said that he was going to come here and, bring, and do two things, shore up the offensive line and bring in good character guys. And it seems like Becton fits both those molds. Um, you know, 6'7", 364 pounds running a 5'1 at the combine. Uh, I'll sign me up for that every day. So I am, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of this pick, and I think it's a good pick for the Jets. Taryn, your thoughts? Uh, I, man, I don't know. I was a little bit shocked 
I, I get it. And like, I saw a lot of people saying like, oh, you, you had your pick of the litter for wide receivers, but you took some tackle, even though a bunch of other ones, you know, have already been taken. There's a chance, I mean, that the Jets had Becton as the number one tackle on their board. So that doesn't matter. But still, I just think personally, if you have problems all over the O-line, one tackle to me does not move the needle as much as a true number one wide receiver does. Um, and the ability to have your choice of Lamb, Judy, whoever was the number one wide receiver on your board without having to trade up, I think that's where the value was in the draft. And I also think that would have made the biggest impact while still plugging a need. That's what I think the difference is between the two New York teams where the Jets have offensive line issues across the board. The Giants really just needed a tackle where I felt the same way with you. I thought this was, do you talk about Judy and Darnold? Like, man, that would have been special, bro. And right away you'd see an impact because let's, let's not beat around the bush. Who's he throwing to? It's Crowder and, and what? You're going to trust Herndon at tight end? They lost Robbie Anderson. Like, what, Tim, what else is there that he's throwing to? Rashard Perriman? Yeah. Quincy <laughs> yeah. Inunua? Yeah. So, like, I mean, hopefully they, they take a guy like – like um, yeah, there's a lot of guys. I, I, I really like uh, Michael Pittman Jr. I hope that they take Michael Pittman Jr. in the second round, so maybe they address that there. Um, it is something to be said that they, they have a brand-new center, a brand-new – a brand new guard, a brand new right tackle, and now a brand new left tackle. So the offensive line, you know, what is going to be completely different than it was last year. And that was the biggest thing. Like it, you, you can't get it to a wide receiver if you're not protected. And Sam Darnold was running for his life, uh, seeing ghosts, as he said. So, um, look, I would have loved one of those wide receivers, but I, I like the fact that you have a left tackle that, you know, Joe Douglas is also a guy who made his, his salt and like kind of, made his reputation on picking offensive linemen. And, and there was a report that said that he was the number one tackle on the board for the Jets. So, I mean, you can't really complain about that. The protection or wide receiver, I would have been happy with either one. The Jets really had a nice spot here. So, um, you know, hopefully they can find a wide receiver in the second round. I think the panic really happened because of people's expectations to not see Judy there and not see C.D. Lamb there. And then they're like, oh, my God, they ought to take one. The, the only pushback that I can make, I, I like it. I like it because, you know, my philosophy is you find a quarterback, you protect them, and you go after theirs. That's how I would, you know, if I ever had three first-round picks and I was a GM and I was just brand new to a situation and I had no quarterback, that's how I would address my roster. I would take a quarterback first, I take an offensive lineman, then I take an edge rusher, or at least I'd leave my draft well, my first three picks being those situations. And, yo, you got it. You're right, Tim. Like, yo, you can have, you can have Judy, Julio, Amari Cooper, and, and fucking Odell. But if, if I'm playing offensive line for you, like, you ain't going to have much time to, to, to pass. So it was, it was probably a bigger need. And also, yo, you got you to gotta factor this thing in, too. How many young quarterbacks have just had their confidence shot because they've gotten beaten up? Fuck, Andrew Luck retired because the first two, three years, he got fucking anal. And then all of a sudden, it turns out to him retiring because he had no protection. By the time they built the offensive line, he's like, yo, I've had all these injuries. I haven't had time off for seven years because I'm either rehabbing or I'm playing. So if you're the Jets, like, this was sort of a desperate play also where you got to protect this kid, man. He's getting hit. He's getting... Even when he's not getting sacked, he's getting hit. And the whole ghost thing, I've come around on that, Tim, where I liked it a lot because I thought it was an honest moment for him. Like, yeah, bro, I'm struggling right now. I see ghosts. And I'm a big fan of you just being transparent and telling me, like, yo, sometimes shit happens and I'm struggling right now. So the whole ghost thing, I think we can move on from. But I, I like I like uh, Becton here, man. It's something that you really needed. It's not flashy. I know um, one of my Jeb buddies was like, the the deepest draft of wide receivers and we take O-line. I'm like, yo, bro, like, don't matter. Like I said before, man, it don't matter who your weapons are. If you can't protect for your QB, it's, it's night, night. Facts, facts. All right, let's jump around a little bit. Um, Taryn, lead us off. What, what pick kind of was like a head scratcher from you? 
like from from here on out? Is it the next one? Ooh, uh, you know, it's funny because it's it's the next one, but it's honestly both of the Raiders picks. Okay. So, like, it goes hand in hand. The next one, Henry Ruggs, I, I, I said when it was uh, when they were on the clock, I was like, I'm pretty sure I read that John Gruden's got a boner for Henry Ruggs, and mm. clearly, you know, he did. It, it just – it doesn't make much sense to me because – Again, you know, whatever you're looking for, it's hard for me to understand. And it's not like I'm the king evaluator of prospects or anything. But looking at him and Judy, I don't know what you think you're getting that you wouldn't be getting with a guy like Jerry Judy because he had a faster 40 time. Like Judy's a better route runner. And on the same team caught more than double the amount of deep targets last year than Henry Ruggs. So if you want a deep threat, it's it's not like Henry Ruggs is a better option there necessarily either. So I was a little confused by that pick. And then their their corner uh, that they took at 19, uh, Damon Arnett, was uh, I think the lowest graded person that got drafted in the first round on PFF's big board. It was my cornerback like 11 or 12, I think. So just a bunch of head scratchers there from the uh, from the Las Vegas Raiders. <laughs> yeah, dude, that, piggybacking. Sorry, go ahead. That pick screamed fucking Al Davis sitting up out of his casket and being like four two seven four two seven. <laughs> all right, Darius Hayward Bay all over again. Martavius Bryant. They tried to make a thing like he. They love speed in Oakland. So yeah, I didn't understand this one. Um, they brought up the stat about like every other pass went for a touchdown or some shit, some some ridiculous statistic. And I thought of Devin Smith. Tim, you remember Devin Smith coming out of Ohio uh, State? Yeah, I, I, I same shit with him. Was like, yo, every other pass he caught went for a, it was like a fifty yarder or shit. It's like, yeah, bro, but like, I don't know, man. Judy is Judy was my favorite wide receiver coming out. I liked him more than CD Lamb. Because anytime I hear someone say that you're the second coming of Julio Jones, I just feel <laughs> a s- sizzling temptation in an area of my body. <laughs> so I was all in on Judy. And just like, yo, just like the eye test, right? Like for me, for me, it was Judy all along. Like route running, sure, you run a faster 40, congrats. But like if you run Chris Browns, like Adam Thielen is always open in the NFL. He don't run no 427. It's because, yo, if you're a great route runner, you could – buy space and open yourself up i didn't understand this one but i guess in the afc west people just want to build with with speed to compete in that division yeah building off that like these wide receivers i I think that like you said the afc west build with speed i think the one i was talking about before where this is definitely a let's look at the division type of pick and let's go with what the division is going with and you saw that the kansas city chiefs win a super bowl on speed and Henry Ruggs is, I think, a direct correlation to John Gruden wants his Tyree kill. The only problem is we've never had a Tyree kill before, ever. So if you're trying to draft a player who's a one-in-a-generation type player, then that's probably not going to work out for you. Don't like the pick. Unfortunately for that, um, as we're talking about the wide receivers, Jerry Judy falls to the Denver Broncos, where I think that's the perfect – place for him uh, a lot of the a lot of what wasn't being said a lot was that a lot of Jerry Judy's production came out of the slot right so if you're if you are Denver you have an opportunity to put Jerry Judy in the slot and move him around the formation all over because you already have that number one superstar type wide receiver on Cortland Sutton on the outside and you, ha- you you've been building your offensive line you signed some offensive line guys this year and now you have a young quarterback and you have him weapons and I know this might not be a popular thing, but I love C.D. Lamb to the Cowboys. I think the Cowboys have that offensive line in place, and they're going to sign Dak Prescott to a, a long-term deal, so why not have Dak Prescott have all the weapons he can? And the amount of problems that you're going to have, and you, you saw last year, Kellen Moore has a more spread offense. The amount of problems you're going to have trying to guard Michael Gallup, Amari Cooper, and C.D. Lamb all at the same time, 
there's there's a possibility that Amari Cooper is the third best wide receiver of that group, and he just got a hundred million dollar contract. So I can see Amari Cooper going around the uh, all around the formation. It's going to cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. I think Ceedee Lamb landed in a great spot. I think Judy. The Broncos were talking about trading up to ten to get Judy. They didn't have to. They got their guy at fifteen. Great job by by uh, uh, John Elway and company, which you don't ha- you don't really say that often, but great job by John Elway. And I, I think in terms of the wide receivers, besides the Rugs pick, I really like I really like the landing spots for the other two guys. I personally didn't understand the Lamb pick. Um, I felt like they should have went defense. Their offense is going to be phenomenal. I understand that. But, like, their biggest issue last year for Dallas was defensively they couldn't make stops when they needed to. They couldn't generate a pass rush often. And this this is a team that got fucking Robert. Yo, Robert Quinn just got paid this offseason, fellas, by the Bears, right? Like, Robert Quinn was a dude who was basically on, like, a VM. He was getting, like, $6 million last year for an edge rusher. And he produced. But... There was just so many times where I was watching the Cowboys and Alan and I made, I was like, yo, like fucking, is it 2012 again? Like why is Robert Quinn just making mad plays? But this is a team that I think defensively, offensively, they're going to be a problem, but defensively they have a problem. And they also lost Byron Jones also. Now maybe you didn't want to reach for one of these defensive players. And I feel that, but I just think that if you're the Cowboys, you're look, CD lamb is going to be dope. Rumors are that, Tim, his number is going to be 10. So, Lamb 10, oh, but it's boy. a Cowboy jersey. Are you, I'm, I'm about to say, shit. I'm so sick, man. yo. One of my guys <laughs> from the Twitch chat, shout out to Chino, member of the VM Patreon also, was like, yo, I'm going to buy you that jersey. And it's a gift, yo. I can't say no to a gift. I'm like, <laughs> no, it's going to be hard. <laughs> I think, just piggybacking off what you guys said, I love Judy to Denver. You got Drew Locke there, if you think he's your guy. You also have Cortland Sutton on the other side, too. Another young wide receiver that you could build with. Font, I'm a fan of, too. I, I personally like him. I just think that it, it took a while for him to get acclimated to the NFL, but he did show flashes as well. Um, Henry Ruggs was just the ultimate Oakland Raiders pick with Al Davis. Uh, like I said, we're going to be bouncing around a little bit. Taryn, you are a Green Bay Packer fan. If you thought we weren't going to get to this, you are out of your oh, mind. Boy. Um, they take a quarterback, and in the sports book over at uh, Lamb Enterprise, uh, it was minus 15,000 that Aaron Rodgers was going to be devastated and angry at the fact that a quarterback got taken. So what are your thoughts on Jordan Love? Oh, man. Uh, I was heartbroken. I I can't lie. It feels a little bit like... The end is near. Yeah. Uh. You know, coming off a year where you're in the NFC Championship game, granted, got their ass whooped, but in the ch- NFC Championship game, nonetheless, you go 13-3, and three, whether, you over- whether you think they overperformed or not. And you're in a position to plug a need, fill value, and, you know, it, instead you give up assets to go get a backup quarterback. That like, I, And I try not to be like, he would have been there in the second or the third. Because you never know. And if you believe in a quarterback, you have to go get him. Amen. So I try not to do that. But I... Still, I just don't understand. You know, I know it worked with Aaron Rodgers, uh, you know, when they drafted him when Brett Favre was getting up there in age. But it's not always going to be like that because the situation is not going to be the same. What if Aaron is still playing at a high level in four years? Now you have no idea what you've got in this kid. So and, and you have to move on. So do you start him or do you try to draft another replacement? It just it just sucks, man. They were in a, a prime position to fill a need, get some value, and improve, you know, while they have Aaron Rodgers still playing at a high level, and they just chose to look into the future. Hey, real quick, because uh, I love what you said there. C- can we stop with the, well, it worked out with Aaron Rodgers that he sat behind someone, and then it worked out with Pat Mahomes that he sat behind someone. Uh, 
uh, good morning. It's two of the fucking best quarterbacks that I've ever been. So, like, not everyone's going to just right. turn out to be fucking Aaron Rodgers and Pat Mahomes. So, let's, yeah. let's just pump the brakes a little yeah. bit. New I slash like, Aaron Rodgers I like, I like, behind me and he'd still be good. <laughs> yeah. I like Jordan Love, though, man. Again, I, I'm a fan of the quarterbacks. I come from small schools. He, he didn't play with no A recruits and five-star recruits. And the year before was a lot better than his past season. But, dude, I think he's a wild card. I think he's... His ideal situation for me, if I could fantasy draft this draft, I would have put him on the Colts because at least you know with the Colts, you have a good young offensive line. You have an up-and-coming defense. You have a veteran in Phillip Rivers who is one of the best quarterbacks of this generation, whether you pride yourself on factoring in titles and whatnots. is a dude who didn't miss a start in 15 years and 4,000 yards every single season, had his team in positions to win countless times, and he was on a one-year deal. So if I was the Colts, or if I was fantasy booking, to use a wrestling term, this draft, I would have put Jordan Love on a team like that because of what you said. We're like, yo, look, they went 13-3, to man. We were talking about them making a trade for, like, a Manny Sanders after week one. Even with the Bears, I was like, yo, look, like, I know they won that game against Chicago opening night, but it's pretty much Devontae Adams or nothing. Like, MVS was a thing, and Geronimo was a thing also, (laughs) but you needed another another wide receiver opposite of Devontae Adams. And then you look at what Minnesota did in your own division – you look at what Detroit did in their own division. They got a lockdown quarter to take away Devontae Adams. You look at Minnesota, they took a guy who would have been an ideal wide receiver for what you were doing in Justin Jefferson. So I feel that why Rodgers is upset, and I would be too, man, because I would present what you just said. Like, yo, bro, like I had – it was Devontae and myself. No offense to everyone else, but it ain't like Rodgers hasn't thrown anyone under the bus before. So yeah. – it, it it I totally side with Rogers here on the frustration. I, I get it. I get it. Can I can I say something? A frustrated Aaron Rodgers is exactly what I would want if I was a Green Bay Packers fan. I'm tell you like Aaron Rodgers, look, the physical tools are still there. The he, I think there's too much made on the fact that he doesn't have a number two wide receiver because he has a great running back. He has two very productive running backs. He has a very good offensive line, and he has one really good receiver. So do the fact that the other guys aren't as good, yeah. I mean, but how important is a number two receiver at the end of the day? I think what you see in Aaron Rodgers only throwing two interceptions again last year is that he has been one of the safest quarterbacks in the last two, three years. He doesn't take chances. He doesn't go down the field. He doesn't, he's not the Aaron Rodgers that we once knew. And I think Jordan Love being on his ass, breathing down his neck, is going to put some reinvigoration into Jordan, Aaron Rodgers. I really do. And when you have a guy like Jordan, uh, Jordan Love, whose physical traits are all there, like he, he really looks like Pat Mahomes in college. And that's a lot. That's a big statement. But if you look at him, like the way he throws the ball, the arm strength he has, his ability to move – he checks all the physical boxes. If you can sit him beside Aaron Rodgers for two, three years, that's the Green Bay Packers setting themselves up for the next quarterback in line. And if you're Aaron Rodgers and you're mad about that, then guess what? Uh, you can choose to do what Brett Favre did to you and kind of give you the cold shoulder for four years, or you can embrace it and you can be mad and you can step your game up. And I think that spending a first-round pick – in order to make Aaron Rodgers into the great one again is worth it because it's been a decade since Aaron Rodgers has been in the Super Bowl. And if I'm a Packers fan, that's unacceptable to me. That's not something that I'm okay with when I have one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. I need to at least be in the Super Bowl more often, particularly in the NFC. So I think this draft pick of Jordan Love if it is not only for three years down the road, but it's also for right now because I think that Aaron Rodgers needs a little fire on under his ass. He's been R E L A Xing a little too much, in my opinion. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take much to piss off Aaron Rodgers, also. You just have to be like uh, a guy that drops the ball or a family member. <laughs> He's basically on his, on his shit list for the most part. Uh, New England traded out of the first round, got two more draft picks. The Chargers came in. They take Kenneth Murray. 
Um, the linebacker out of Oklahoma. I like Murray. I liked Murray a lot. You look at the Chargers defense now, just stallions everywhere. Bosa, Linval Joseph they brought in. Melvin Ingram, Perryman, Chris Harris Jr. they brought in. Like You're looking at like six, seven all-pro caliber players. Derwin James, Casey Hayward is still productive. Desmond King was a, a big piece of their defense too. And they also get their quarterback, and now they get a linebacker there. My biggest concern is maybe I need to adapt him, but I'm not trading up at all unless it's a QB. I'm just not doing it, bro. I hear that. I'm just not. I can't do it, man. I can't. Like, it just doesn't make sense more times than not. And, and I know, like, if Allen was here, we'd be like, well, it worked out for the Falcons with Julio. It's like, yeah, it worked out. But there's been countless times where it hasn't also. More times than not, it doesn't. And no player is as valuable as the QB still. And it'll probably always be that, that way. And to, to trade two draft picks to get back into the first round to take a linebacker, I don't know. That was, I that was one that kind of upset me because I, for some reason, I have like a weird attachment to the Chargers still. Uh, Kenneth Murray, uh, apparently, from everything I heard about him, he might also be going for his sainthood after he's done with football. So um, that's a good pick for their. I, I I really like the inside linebackers. And- Linebackers, not the that fuck much does of... sainthood have to do? Can you make plays? That's what I want. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> apparently he's like the best guy in the world, and he's a great leader, and he's a great player. Um, I love the Kenneth Murray pick. I, I mean, trading up for him is that's a question mark. But if you're gonna, if you feel that well about him, I love Patrick Queen to the Baltimore Ravens coming out, coming um, talking about inside linebackers as well. Um, they had a big needed inside linebacker, and Patrick Queen is one of those guys who come from. Uh, Comes from LSU, so he's been playing in the big game, and he just seems like a Baltimore Ravens fit. Um, Lamar Jackson's already called him Ray Lewis Jr., so I love that inside linebacker pick. Um, Don't know much about Jordan Brooks from Texas Tech, who the Seahawks decided is better than Patrick Queen, Um, but the Baltimore Ravens always seem like someone falls into their lap, and that's great. And uh, I think the inside linebackers in the first round is something that um, is going to be really interesting to watch. I really thought he was going to end up on the Saints because he went to LSU. The Saints are a little banged up at linebacker. Kiko Alonso is coming off a knee injury, and they also lost Klein to Buffalo. So when you were looking at that, I thought that maybe him going to the Saints would have been perfect. But, yeah, Ravens, man. Ravens, yo, aren't the Ravens like the Spurs where when the Ravens take a defensive player, you're just kind of always like, yo, he's going to be good. Like the same way when the Spurs in basketball, they take a Euro guy. They're like, yo, when the Knicks take a Euro guy, you're like, what the fuck is going on? But then when the Spurs do it, you're like, yo, this is going to be the next Dirk. That's how I feel like with the Ravens when it comes to defensive players. Yeah, something about defensive players when they put on the purple and black, it's like they're the monsters. It's, they just <laughs> breed them. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, I'm with you. It. That one, I loved that pick um, just because it's the perfect fit. And it was, you know, extra heartbreaking. When the Packers traded up from 30 to 26, I was like jumping four spots, going ahead of the Seahawks and Ravens, who probably both want a linebacker with Queen on the board. They're taking them. And I was hyped. And, uh, you know, it didn't work out that way. But, yeah, I, I like Patrick Queen to the Ravens. And I'm with you, Nick, for the Chargers. I also, for some reason, have a weird attachment to the Chargers. I just always root for them to do. Like, I just it's always the jerseys, want them to do bro. Well. It's them powder blues. It's the powder yeah, blues. probably. <laughs> Best jerseys in the NFL. Not even close. They're, they're so good. I'm with you. But, uh, yeah, trading up for a inside linebacker, just in general, I'm usually not for. And then Kenneth Murray specifically, like, depending on what you value – for me in today's NFL, if you can't cover as an off-ball linebacker, then your value goes way down. And he reminds me of like a Blake Martinez type, who's you know he can he's a surefire tackler. He can you know <laughs> yeah he can run up the middle. He can close an open window and stuff people in the run game. But like four pass breakups in three years in college uh, as as a, as a starter, and it's just. The value's not there for me, and 
even if they didn't have to trade up, I wouldn't necessarily liked it. So giving up two picks just makes it even worse. I think another really, really weird situation that played out was what San Francisco did when you factor in both of their draft picks. So first of all, they trade with Tampa Bay, just one spot. I don't know if there were reports that San Francisco liked Werfs, but Tampa Bay trades with San Francisco. Remember San Francisco got a first round pick from the Colts because of Buckner. So San Francisco takes Javon Kinlaw, who, just another first-round pick on the defensive line. I guess build on a strength, which is something that I saw the Giants not do. Where the Giants, when they won those Super Bowls, they had a great offensive line and a great defensive line. And what happened? They let that deteriorate. Deteriorate. Did I say that right? You got it. Yeah, I got, I got it the second time. Uh, and they're like, yo, we have a D-line, we have an O-line, so let's – take a chance on Matthias Kiwanuka. Let's take a chance on Aaron Ross, Prince of Mukamara. You start trying to fill out the rest of your roster, and then over time, what happens? Your shit falls apart. San Francisco is like, fuck that. Our, we're known for our defensive line. We're going to keep adding to that shit. So they take Kinlaw. Now, the reason I'm not so much against that, I feel it. I don't understand how like, you don't take Judy there. You don't take Lamb there. And then you end up taking a wide receiver later on who... I'll be honest with you, I didn't know much about Ayuku, Ayuku out of Arizona State, but especially when you use you lose Manny Sanders too, I just thought like Judy would have been dope there. You get another weapon for Garoppolo, and you get a replacement for Manny Sanders, who was a big part of their offense. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting that they used the first-round pick to just replace the same position at a cheaper price. Again, drafting a defensive tackle that early, I'm not sure if that's what I would do if I were them. But, I mean, if they were high on Ayuk, um, you know you know Sofo, Nick, you know Sofo. He goes to Arizona State. He says uh, Ayuk is the truth. So um, that's my that's my big scouting report on I, Ayuk. I know somebody that goes to Arizona State. But, uh, uh, I mean, if they, if they like that, I, I like the Jalen Rager pick. Uh, to the Eagles. I'm talking about wide receivers. Uh, I, I love the Jeff, Justin Jefferson pick um, to the to the Vikings. Uh, I think that both of those fit uh, really big needs as well. And um, yeah, I love it. I, I love those picks. I think uh, you know half of these picks aren't going to work out because that's just the uh, the mathematics behind the draft. Um, but for a lot of these teams, I think a lot of good players went to a lot of places where they could succeed. Um, I know where we're, I'm jumping around a little bit, and I want to give Taryn a, Taryn a, a chance to talk about this too, but I'm, I'm going to talk about Clyde Edwards Hilaire in a second. And that's, that's one I fucking love, but I'm going to let Taryn talk about the other guys first. Taryn, is there anything else uh, in the draft that you want to address? For the well, just to comment on the 49ers, it's actually funny. I actually, my best friend goes to Arizona State also, so I watched like a lot of extra of Brandon Ayuk. But the way I also thought it was a little weird and probably not the way I would have done it, just for the reasons that you guys said. But it really felt like they're just sitting there thinking, okay, let's just, you know, replace this D tackle. We just went to the Super Bowl, and Brandon Ayuk to me is very Debo Samuel-esque except he's got like Kevin Durant wingspan he's got he's a freak I don't know if you guys have seen but he's only like 6'1 or something but he's got the wingspan of like a seven foot tall person he's it's weird one inch less um, than Calvin Johnson yeah 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 see there you go so it really just felt like they're like okay we'll just reload on the d-line and you guys had problem with problems with one Debo Samuel uh putting them in space so how about another one that's just extra lanky so, you know, it's they they liked who they liked and they went for it, but we'll see if it works out, I guess. You know, they've been drafting pretty well though the last couple of years. So it's one of those things where I think San Francisco has earned enough like clout amongst people in media where it's one of those organizations now where, you know, as long as Garoppolo is upright, what they're doing is working for them. When when Kyle Shanahan takes a player that can be described as gadgety, it makes me think that 
it's going to work out. It's kind of like what you said with the Ravens on defense. I'm like, oh, he knows. Like, he's going to be a stud. Listen, man, he got Taylor Gabriel paid. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> like, yeah, no, no knock to Taylor Gabriel, but, like, for the money that he was signing, that was – crazy and that all happened because of that one year when they went to the Super Bowl with the Falcons and Gabriel had like nine touchdowns or some shit and it was he had more red zone targets than like Julio Jones so all right the last one for me that I want to mention and then uh we can we can come out to a conclusion on this episode um I another lock for me was the Eagles were going to take a wide receiver I just thought that they would take Justin Jefferson out of LSU. They end up taking Jalen Rigor, who, Taryn, I think around, like, pick nine, you were telling me that Rigor to the Eagles was what was going to happen. Yep. Uh, but for me, the reason why I said that was Rigor, uh, Justin Jefferson more so than Rigor because Jefferson lined up, like, 98% in the slot and right now what the Eagles really need is a slot wide receiver. No idea why my alarm is going off at this time. Actually I do know because this is the time I usually wake up because yo Tim, <laughs> I'm enjoying quarantine season, bro. Not having to Very wake up, up at two forty five in the morning. I just wake up whenever. It's pretty lit. But back to Justin Jefferson, he lined up around ninety seven or ninety eight percent of his snaps at LSU out of the slot. The Eagles lose Aguilar in free agency. They need a slot wide receiver, and they just needed a wide receiver. They Shit, they showed that graphic of the guys that were catching passes for them, and it was just crazy. It was crazy. (laughs) So I like that they went wide receiver because I I thought that was the biggest lock of the draft as far as, like, what team was going to draft what position coming in. Like, you knew they were going to take one even when the season was still going on. Like, the Eagles are going to spend a first-round pick on a wide receiver. Yeah, and I think it's a better a better fit. Uh, Taron could talk about that because you you saw it coming. I think it's a great fit for the Eagles too, better than Jeff, Justin Jefferson would have been. Yeah, I, I'm with you. That I saw all over Twitter and everything. Every Eagles fans were upset because they wanted Justin Jefferson. Like, and I I get that they want someone to line up in the slot. I don't think that um, Jalen Rager can't do that if they want him there. But I think they need someone more that can stretch the field and and be on the outside. You saw the effect that it had on them when um, – why am I blanking on his name? D. Jackson. At, yeah, yeah. Deshaun Jackson went down uh, last year. And and Jay the Rager can be that guy. Justin Jefferson is like – so much of his prowess is just in the middle of the field. And like they have Zach Ertz for that. That, that, that That's all they have right now, uh, honestly, it, when I look at their wide receiving core. So – I was a big fan, and, yeah, I, I saw it coming just because it was too perfect, and I wanted the Packers to get him, and I knew that, you know, I'm not that lucky. This uh, I know you want to wrap it up. Final thoughts for me, I just want to talk about Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, and this is another guy who just fits the Andy Reid scheme so perfectly, and he's he caught 50 passes in college, which is fucking ridiculous for a, a running back out of college. He's the best back there that they have and it's just another weapon for Andy Reid to throw across formations and you don't know what the fuck's going on when he's on the field he can catch the ball he can run the ball and if you look at his measurables his measurables are suspiciously close to a running back that Andy Reid was very familiar with and that is Brian Westbrook so um some, something Andy Reid saw something in Clyde Edwards Hilaire uh, that made him the first running back off the board. And I bow down to you, Mr. Reid. You uh, know exactly what the fuck you're doing. And uh, I think that, like, f- personally, as you guys know, I, I host a fantasy show. He's the 101 in terms of rookie dynasty drafts as of right now. So, gotta love, uh, gotta love some Clyde Edwards Hilaire in Kansas City catching. Who knows how many balls out of the backfield from Patty Mahomes? He's not fast enough for their offense. He runs he runs four six forty. So it's not good enough for me. I'm not happy. Failure. Or two or bust. Nah, he's very versatile on a serious note. He's very versatile and he's gonna be fine just because the guy pulling the strings there is gonna get him open and he's never going to be a number one or two or three option for a team to stop. So when you talk about the scheme where he's going, it's awesome. I just think 
if I was Kansas City, you know what I would have done? I probably would have taken a defensive tackle because you don't know what's going to happen with Chris Jones. He hasn't signed his franchise tag yet, and he's asking for north of $20 million, and that could be maybe uh, a leverage play on Kansas City if that was to be the case. But it was a very interesting first round. I think a lot of teams kind of went chalk as far as what they needed to do and what they needed to draft. So I don't know how long this podcast has been because I do <laughs> zoom. This is the first time recording on zoom and they don't have like a timer for how long it's been, but I hope you guys enjoyed the coverage of this first round. Enjoy the rest of the draft on behind, uh, behalf of myself and VM. Thank you all for listening. Taryn, where can they find you if they want to contact you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Taryn.Caravella, T-A-R-E-N dot Caravella. And then on, on Twitter, which is where most of my uh, football stuff and sports related stuff is, is at Talkin TDs, T-A-L-K-I-N-T-D-S. Taryn, I appreciate the work you've been doing for VM behind the scenes. Also, just to make that public, you've been crushing it with some of the, whether it's stats for the show or just uh anything that i need you to do i appreciate it um and uh tim where can they find you i know there's been a change to your yo i had no idea you changed your fucking uh your your twitter name i don't know how long it's been but i remember i was just looking for it the other day and i just couldn't find it and then i saw it it's been a month or two i think we've been trying to trying to you know get it you know together uh so anyway you could find me at brodo ff tim and you could find uh uh, if you want to know about the fantasy aspects we're gonna be doing a fantasy um kind of we're doing a fantasy show on saturday about the rounds one through three and the fantasy implications that you have there because traditionally and again like nick said this is going to be a whole different draft so traditionally um in the fourth through seventh rounds you're not going to find anyone who's going to have an automatic fantasy impact except a few guys so we're going to be doing rounds one through three and going over that just the fantasy wise we're going to have jason moore the fantasy footballers um on on um on thursday very excited about that one of my big influences and uh, find everything at brotofantasy.com. And, uh, yeah, it was great to be back on VM. Always always love chopping it up with the lamb. And uh, it was great chopping it up with you as Tim. Tim. Yeah, always, I, I had a great time. Tim always coming through whenever I ask to, to get on. Last thing I want to mention is uh, the members of the Patreon that get the shout-out. Nick Chavez, Ryan Pisner, Christopher Velasquez, Corey Johnson Hoops, Derek Plates, and Daniel Gibson, and also... Big shout out to Jonathan Garcia, a.k.a. Goose. He won the Patreon contest. He's going to get a custom VM merch. He said he wants it in blue and white. He's a Cowboy fan. So if you're listening to this, you'll probably get your stuff within the next four years. I'm not going to rush to make that. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you guys next time.